Hi everyone, I'm Simon Stewart. I'm a, an, an engineer from the uh, London office. Uh, my team is the internal tools team and I focus on developer productivity and effectiveness. That basically means that I write tools and infrastructure to allow people to write um, tests and build their code fast. The main thing I do is I work on our end-to-end -end Android testing and I also help out with some of our build tools. You may be wondering who these guys are. Um, this is Bunny and this is Monkey and they're my son's favorite toys, and when I left London, I promised that I would bring them with me and uh, they could help me do all the sorts of things that I do. So, uh, hello everybody, and hello everybody. <laughs> there we go, you go sit there. You gonna be all right? Good. Excellent. So, with that out of the way, um, quick agenda of what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, first of all, we're gonna cover how we actually write code at Facebook. It doesn't magically appear. It would be nice if it magically appeared, wouldn't it? I'd, I'd really appreciate that. And then, um, once we've covered how we write code um, and the tools that are specific, uh, that are shared between Android and iOS, we'll go on to talk about what's happening on Android, and we'll talk about what's happening on iOS. Um, and then finally, if I haven't got my timings all horribly, horribly wrong, um, there'll be plenty of time for questions and hopefully answers. Sound good? Yeah, it sounds perfect. Yeah, one person said yeah. I assume the rest of you are quite enthusiastic about this. I'm a huge fan of open source. So, um, quick recap of uh, things that we already know from earlier today. Uh, our mobile apps are big, right? Um, our iOS app is a basically a native app, but there are some places where we wrap a web view and we display content um, from within a web view. Um, and sometimes those are places where we're still iterating on the, on the interface and the UI, and sometimes it's just like we haven't got around to it yet. But uh, it's a combination of both a native app and a web app. And we support uh, from iOS 6 and above. And that kind of means that we cover a vast majority of the iOS-wielding users out there. That's kind of nice. This is our Android app. It looks very, very similar. You can tell it's different just because of the icons down at the bottom. Um, our Android app is, is also a native application, which occasionally wraps a web view for fun games and uh, huge entertainment value. Um, we support from Froyo up. So the interesting thing with Android is there are just so many different versions. And one of the engineering challenges we face is like, how do we support the regular devices that people carry day in, day out? In order to do that, we ship approximately 15 different APKs, different versions of the application. And they cover things such as um, different screen sizes uh, and optimizations based on the images that we pack and things like that. But we ship about 15 different ones. In order to help us achieve the quality, the stability, and just the joy of experience that we would like to bring to people, uh, we recently started a beta program. That beta program is just handled through the Google Play Store and the normal mechanisms. And we reach about a million beta testers um, when, we, when we ship the releases. And we ship those about once every three days or so. Um, so if you want to download the latest and greatest, that's kind of fun. If you want to live on the bleeding edge, we recently, very recently, opened up an alpha program using the same Google Play techniques. Um, we're currently hitting about 20,000 different people, and uh, they must be incredibly patient because we push that once every day. So they're getting a, a brand new version of the app with all the latest features and the bugs uh, once a day, regularly. So there we go, recap. You probably knew most of that. Um, where does open source come into this? You know, where, how do we write code? How do we, um, what tools do we use? What tools could you use if you were attempting to do something on the scale of what we're doing, or even not, if, even if it's sort of uh, something you're working on just on yourself? I think the very first thing you wanna do after writing a line of code is to make sure you never lose it. It's suboptimal to lose code, I think we can all agree. We, there are a number of uh, source control systems out there, but on mobile, uh, we use Git. Uh, within our Git repos, there are sort of north of 100,000 commits, um, and we've got well over 150,000 files, um, and those 150,000 files are worked on by a team of 300 engineers, or actually, I think it's slightly more than 300 now, but um, yeah, it's going well. So that's actually quite a lot of people banging out quite a lot of code. I mean, you know, I don't know about you, but maybe if you do like one or two diffs a day, that's a phenomenal um, amount of code. 
So how do we make sure that the code that we write, and there's a lot of it, um, is actually the quality that we would like it to be? We're huge fans of code review here. If, uh, that means that every single line of code that we put into our code base has had at least two people look at it. The author, who may be a bit of a clown, and the person reviewing it, who's obviously a highly trained engineer who knows exactly what they're doing. That actually, that tends to happen with me. I, I write these diffs, and then my colleagues sort of come back and go, did you mean to do that? And they go, no, no, I didn't. Um, the code review tool that we use is actually open source. If you go to github.com slash Facebook, you can check out, um, uh, uh, you can clone the repo. Um, and it's a tool called Fabricator. We use PHP here, so obviously in the Java world, everyone, everything's got a J. Um, here, PH, super, super popular. Um, this is from an open source tool called Buck, which I'll be covering later. Um, and you can see down at the bottom that Roy has put forward a diff that he wants reviewed, and his entire pl test plan is the fact that it builds. <laughs> at least there was a test plan. Like, the idea is there, right? Um, Michael has requested changes, probably saying, that's not really a test plan. Also, you haven't spelled standard error correctly. Who knows? But that's our code review tool. Uh, and it's got one killer feature that I think makes it better than any other code review tool that I have used ever. That's image macros. Even better, animated image macros. Uh, these are actually genuinely some of the ones that I have never seen on a code review of mine, but which are, are in there. They're, they're in our tool. Um, I often get distracted and just gaze at these things for a little bit. There's something mesmeric about a DJ and cat. <laughs> Love it. So if you don't do code reviews, recommend doing them. If you're starting to pick them up, take a look at Fabricator. Uh, and if you are using Fabricator, take advantage of the fact that you can use animated image macros to make friends and influence people. Sorry, yeah. Um, uh, the button needs to work, because otherwise we'll be here all day, and I'll just be wildly entertained. Don't know about you guys. I'm having a great time. <clears throat> they're, they're enjoying it as well, I'm told. Yeah, good. Um, so we do code reviews. The next thing is you land that code, and you have absolutely no guarantee that what you've landed actually works, right? So we'd like to be able to check that the code that we've written works in an automated and automatic way. So we'd make use of a tool called BuildBot, which is a Python tool for basically assembling your own continuous integration environment. Um, it's incredibly flexible, uh, and we use it extensively here. So what we do is you check in your code, and we do a build. Like, does it even compile on iOS and on Android? Does it compile? Does it seem sort of uh, syntactically correct? We next run lint and static analysis over the top of it. Um, if you were here earlier, and I hope you were, um, Alan covered how we do this on iOS, so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail. But you see that we can use regular expressions in order to make sure that we're doing things like following naming conventions appropriately. We can do static analysis using tools such as Clang. Um, and in the Android world, we make use of the Android linter, and we've written our own Android linting rules, but we build from the one that ships with, uh, with the Android SDK. Um, and if you've never used it before, by the way, there's a really great tool in Java world called FindBugs. I don't know, has, has anyone heard of that? Yeah, some of you have. Do, uh, is anyone here an Android developer? Like, did all the Android developers just raise their hands? OK, cool. Um, so for those of you who aren't on the stage, about half the people who use Android have heard of point bugs. It's fantastic. It just automatically finds and alerts you to a whole bunch of problems you have, um, from trivial things like your lines being too long to shadowing of variables um, and other more serious problems. Uh, highly recommend it if you're not using it. So we've done a build. We've done static analysis. The next stage is to run some tests. Um, we use OC unit. Um, I think we use OC unit occasionally um, to, on, on iOS. And uh, we use it, the, uh, the snapshot test case that Alan was speaking about earlier as well. Um, and that helps us catch sort of some of the regressions and problems we have. On the Android side, we make use of JUnit. Kind of have to. Kent Beck works here. He may not be that offended if we don't use it, but it seems polite, right? And I'm English, and I'm all about being polite. Um, we also use tools such as Roboelectric, um, which is wonderful and I will be covering later. 
Um, again, if you didn't catch it in Alan's talk, you can go download iOS snap, uh, snapshot test case from uh, the Facebook GitHub repo. The URL is there. I'll be putting URLs of everything that we cover um, up at the end of the, the talk, so you don't need to frantically write it now. There'll be just one photo you can take at the end. So that's what we do in a single continuous uh, integration run, but we don't run just one. We run many over the life cycle of a particular diff. And before we start, you can speculatively punt one up into the system and go like, I think this is OK, but it may not be. Can we get a continuous build? Can we run it through the steps it would do? When you send the diff out for review, the, the particular piece of work you're doing, I think Google call them CLs. It's a sort of single logical unit of work that you're trying to, to land into the code base. When you create the diff, we kick off the um, continuous integration, and we feed those results back and display them on Fabricator so that so the person reviewing your code can go, like, the code looks OK, but for some reason, like, every single build is broken. It's probably not the high-quality code you think it is. Every time you respond to review comments and you upload a new version of the diff to Fabricator, we kick things off again. Um, and we're experimenting with automatically landing code into master um, from the continuous integration environment. If you're familiar with tools such as Garrett, they offer features like this. It's, it happens quite a lot in the Android world. Um, so we've got the ability to land through a queue. Um, but certainly, once the code is landed in master, we do another build. And the reason why we do another continuous build at that point is because we've got over 300 engineers working on the code base, even if it's only taking you like an hour or two from writing our initial code to checking in. There can have been quite a lot of churn. And we just want to make sure that everything is as rock solid as possible, because there's nothing worse than checking out like the latest version of the code and then finding that nothing compiles because the person who checked in just before you has completely screwed up the code base. Now, we do our continuous builds. For Android, it's really easy. There's Linux. We've got data centers filled with machines. Um, OS 10, iOS, it's a bit trickier. We have got a rack, at least one rack, uh, full of Mac minis, um, and we use these. I think we're making these plans available on through the Open Compute project. Uh, Christian is nodding. James is going, I don't know. <laughs> Christian's our release manager. Um, yeah, so I think this is going to be made available through the Open Compute project. So if you can't figure out how to put a bajillion uh, I, uh, Mac minis into a rack, we'll make those plans available to you. They're super, super useful, um, and a majority, of the, a, a majority of those machines are used for our continuous builds. So that's the sort of shared infrastructure that we have between Android, iOS. Um, we've already covered some interesting open source tools. BuildBot, super cool tool, go download it. Um, JUnit, things like that. Android, there are tools that we use um, that are specific to Android. Day to day, the most important one that our users use, our developers use, is a tool called Buck. Now, Buck is a, is a build system. Why? You might ask, do we need yet another build system? OK, you're not going to ask it. That's OK. But we do. Uh, go back to when uh, Buck was originally worked on, which I think was late 2000, uh, 2011. I think that's, yeah, 2011, early 2012. Um, we used to use Ant to build our Android code, um, which is the way that, at the time, the Android project recommended you do these things. And uh, when we switched to Buck, what would happen is we'd echo on the screen, by the way, go to this URL, clone this repo, do a build using ant of the, the repo you've just gone, put the, uh, the generated thing on the path, come back to this directory, and run buck build um, fb4a, the, 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 the Android app. And what would happen is once you've completed all those steps, you would have the finished artifact built by buck before the original ant invocation had finished. Now, our users are incredibly demanding. Our developers are incredibly demanding. Um, the thing that they complain about all the time is how slow things are. Um, they still complain about it with Buck, but uh, just occasionally, like Halloween, I think, would be a really good time to do it. We might just flip them back to Ant, and I'll go, gosh, we really do go fast. Um, so the nice thing is it's fast, it's scalable, it's extensible. Um, each of the Buck build files, and I'll show you one in just a little bit, is actually a tiny, tiny little bit, bit of Python. Um, and it describes a, uh, a module. Um, 
you can, because it's Python, you can extend it either by writing macros in more Python um, or making use of a particular thing called a gen file or a gen rule. Um, and the gen rules allow you to add custom build actions to, uh, to your build. It's scalable. It's kind of depressing to uh, do a build and not take advantage of the work that everyone else does. So we cache results, both locally, and we cache them on a Cassandra cluster. So if somebody somewhere has done a build, it's possible to download their built artifacts and take advantage of that. And when you're trying to do a particularly large build, um, that's useful. So um, building, running tests, so the, those are two of the, the, the really crucial things. Up here on the left-hand side of the screen, you've got a definition from a buck build file, uh, which we normally call buck in all capitals. Um, this defines a Android library uh, with the name of UI. And you'll see that its sources are everything in the current directory and below, uh, which are called star.java, so any Java file in this directory or a child directory. There are dependencies that it depends on. Um, I always like to read the slash slash as from the root of the project. So from the top level, of the top of the, 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 the project tree, there is a directory called, for example, res com Facebook share, the colon. In that directory, there is a file called buck. Res, in that buck file, in that build file, there is another rule whose name is, is res. And what this allows us to do is decompose our build into a series of small modules um, that are interrelated. And we can take these fine-grained modules and we can build a, uh, I, I did computer science at university. I don't get to use it very often, so excuse me while I enjoy this. We get to build a directed acyclic graph. <laughs> oh, there we go. Those three years certainly paid off. Uh, and we build the graph bottom, bottom up. Um, but the nice thing is that, you know, you, as you can see in this diagram here, there are independent parts of the graph that we can sort of bolt together. This explains why Buck is as fast, it is, uh, fast as it is, because we can build those independent subgraphs in parallel. And the nice thing is, because we know that we're building a particular type of thing, we don't have to try and reorganize steps or do anything clever. We can take you know, everything that builds a Java library and run it uh, in one go. We're not going to try and interleave steps or try and figure out, like, is it safe to do this jarring yet? Um, if you're using a tool such as Ant, that's not something you can do. You can't take advantage of that. In order to go super fast, we uh, also hash a module's inputs um, and, and its dependencies to determine whether or not we need to build it. Now, if we go back 10 years, uh, five years even, what happens quite frequently is that um, the build tools look at timestamps on files, right? And they figure out whether or not they need to build something based on the timestamp. And that was fine when everyone was using CVS as subversion. But Git, you can sometimes do, um, you can switch branch to a local branch and you can have files that the timestamps don't quite match up, and so it'll look like it doesn't need to do a build, and it really should. The other thing is, because we're building logical units, we know we're building a Java library, we can take advantage of that. So um, if you read the JLS, the Java language specification, uh, it clearly defines what's known as the application binary interface for a Java class. We uh, take advantage of that by, as we compile Java classes, we output something that approximates the ABI. Um, it's a little bit stricter, so we rebuild, strictly speaking, more often than we could. But um, it's better to be safe than sorry, so that's why we do that. Um, and then what happens is, if the ABI hasn't changed, we don't recompile any dependence unless we're packaging things up into a, into a binary or an Android uh, jar. And that means that you can add something like a logging statement to a class that's quite high up in your hierarchy in the build graph, and you won't need to recompile um, half as much as you can as you could have. And finally, uh, we use uh, Cassandra to take advantage of distributed caching. You remember I was talking about BuildBot earlier. What we do is when, when the builds are green, when we know we've got a, a good instance of, um, of the code base, what we do is we pre-populate a Cassandra cluster with all the artifacts that would be built from that so that any uh, developer here at Facebook sitting in Menlo Park can download the latest, greatest version. And that's allowed us to do things like a complete clean build of the app, which locally takes in the order of 10 minutes, um, and slash that down to a single minute. What I'm going to do now is I'll do you a demo of uh, Buck, and you can see how fast it is for yourself. Um, so if we can just flip the display, please. 
Da, 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 da. Right. Here um, you can see I, this is the open source version of Buck. I checked it out earlier, um, and I did a build. And as you can see, that build, um, which was a clean build from scratch, took 53 seconds to do the build, jar everything up, um, and run the tests. Now, you know, waiting a minute for a build is, 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 isn't that bad, right? It's not like the XKCD cartoon of the people doing fencing. So let's do the same build using Buck. What we're going to do is we're going to use Buck to build Buck from a, from a clean, clean flight, uh, slate. So none of the outputs of Buck are currently on the file system. We're going to use Buck to build itself. And then we're going to run every single test in the tree. Boom. So one of the nice things you see here is this is the, um, we call it the super console. And you can see that it's trying to take advantage um, of the nature of the build graph and do everything in parallel. So it's already completed the build, and it's now running things. Um, what you don't realize, or what's not immediately apparent, is that these tests are being run, run in parallel. With Ant, um, everything was being run in serial, and that was kind of distressing. And, uh, and uh, oh, here we go, it's done. So 27 seconds, even on a relatively simple code base, we've halved the build time. Now, imagine if uh, we were taking advantage of the fact that we had a distributed cache. Could have pulled down those artifacts. I wouldn't have needed to have built them locally. And it would have gone even faster. And there's a tool called BuckDemon, which keeps an eye on the file system, which means that when we build, uh, when we do a no-op build of our production app, which is big, right, over 150,000 files, even though we hash everything, we can do a no-op build in under half a second. Super, super fast, and that's really important. So Buck, it sounds kind of fun. If it's piqued your interest, if you're an uh, Android developer, um, do come and take a look at it. The uh, documentation is there on the web. Um, there is a Google group which you can go to for help and support. Um, and uh, we run it as a proper open source project. We really, really love pull requests. So send us some pull requests. Like I said, um, I'll be putting up all the URLs at the end of the slide, so there's no need to rush right now, unless you're super, super keen to get started and migrate your entire company over, in which case, go for it. So we, we, we built things. We know that it works. Um, we want to run unit tests. We run unit tests using J, JUnit. Um, but unit tests don't cover everything. And what we'd like to do is guarantee that the application works as well as it can. Now, as well as being an engineer in the infrastructure team, I'm also the lead of the Selenium project and I, I invented WebDriver. So when somebody said to me, how are we meant to do end-to-end -end testing for Android? I suggested using something based on, on Android, uh, on WebDriver, and we ended up picking Cellandroid. So Cellandroid is written by our friends at eBay, um, and it's a lovely bit of kit. It uses the instrumentation frameworks, but presents you with the WebDriver APIs, allowing you to control your app. Here you can see us introspecting into um, the current display, and uh, figuring out how we would be able to locate this element again. It's kind of nice. But the problem with end-to-end -end tests, by their nature, they're the flakiest tests in your system, right? They need everything to be working. And they are incredibly slow. Our developers love to go fast. Your developers probably love to go fast as well, unless they're lazy, in which case they should be going faster anyway. To help solve that problem, we use Roboelectric. Um, we actually use Roboelectric version 2. That's a JVM-based Android testing. Version 2 is based on code from the AOSP, the Android Open Source Project. Um, and that allows us to get a really nice fast cycle time. If you're using sort of some of the instrumentation, uh, instrumentation test case or activity test case that ship with Android, what you need to do is you need to take your Java, compile it to a class file, run it through DEX, take the DEX, build the, the thing you're going to deploy, copy that over to the device, start it up. I'm going to run out of stage soon. Start it up on the device, and that takes a long time. With Roboelectric, our developers can sit in their IDE, hit the run the tests right now, please, um, and they can get that fast feedback loop that we all crave when we're developing software. So it helps us go faster, and that helps us um, write excellent software that isn't as crash as it used to be. So that's Android. iOS, um, I saw earlier that loads of you are iOS developers. Um, 
Who here is happy with the speed of Xcode build? Two people. There's, what, 100, over 100 people here? So approximately 1% of the audience are happy with the speed of Xcode build. We weren't happy with it either. Uh, and if I can get the clicker to work, there we go. <clears throat> and so we developed a tool called XC Tool. Um, the idea was to make our builds go faster and to make it easier for us to get high quality information from our continuous integration testing. So um, it's a command line tool. Um, it basically slots in exactly where, we, where you would use Xcode build. Um, and it's got a couple of like, nifty features. So one of the features that it does is, um, a bit like Buck, it separates out your, your, your tests um, into se smaller separate units and runs, runs those in parallel. So you start getting your feedback um, a little bit faster. Um, and the other thing it does is it's built on this concept of emitting an event stream of JSON events. And so you can capture those, um, and we use that to do better reporting back to the user and to allow us to do things like uh, capture output in a format that looks like it came from JUnit because all the continuous integration servers out there understand JUnit's format, and so we can display results in a really nice way. Um, we also feed results from our builds, our continuous builds, into Fabricator um, so that, again, if someone puts in a diff that causes problems, causes our tests to fail, we can have that um, be demonstrated. There's nothing quite like being shown the tool in action. Um, so this is what we call um, XC Tools Pretty Reporter. There we go. Um, as you can see, the output is pretty clear. Um, and it tells you just the things that are exciting. There we go. And then um, a test failed at the end. And rather than having to dig through like 300 weight of logs that Xcode build normally does, it's got a concise, actionable piece of reporting for you. So you can start digging into why the test failed that much faster. And we all want to go faster, right? That, that would be really nice. Um, we call that the pretty reporter. What that's doing is it's building on top of the stream of JSON results that are coming out. If you were mad and you wanted to look at the stream of JSON results, they'd look like this. As you can see, um, it gets a bit lost fairly quickly. But as you can see, we're doing one JSON object per line. right? So you can just have, um, and, and this is basically running on a world-class Unix. So you can use those tools to take the output, um, extract meaning from the JSON, and start reporting it appropriately. Uh, <coughs> appropriately. Um, so, you know, that's kind of cool, right? We've, we've made our builds faster. Um, we're using Xcode builds somehow. Um, but how are we getting all this data? Like, we've somehow tricked Apple's tooling into emitting JSON. So, behind the scenes, XC Tool is calling out to the same tooling that Xcode would take advantage of. Um, but what we do is uh, we insert um, our own shim libraries to help us capture those events. Um, and you can see that here. Xcode build, we've got our own shim um, for testing and testing. We insert our own shims. Oh, I don't know where I'm meant to point this. I think it's a radio, so it doesn't really matter where I point it. I'll find out later. I'll do like a special flash on. Um, <clears throat> so when you start a build using these uh, shims, basically two things happen. The first one, as you can see here, is we identified that there was this one method in Xcode build that we needed to swizzle, and then we'd be able to get access to the information we needed to. And so that's what we did. We swizzle it um, where uh, 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 the, the method that Xcode would call to emit output um, and things like that. And then what we do is instead of just sort of burping data to stand it out in a sort of meaningless, uh, ill-formatted, verbose way, uh, we generate nice, pretty JSON um, so you can read it and you can take advantage of it. Um, and it's these, event, uh, these JSON objects that XC Tool feeds into its event stream. And then they're passed on to the reporters, and they're used to generate that nice output that you saw earlier. That's kind of really, really nice. We've open sourced this tool as well. So if you're, happy, if you're not happy with the speed of your Xcode builds, do take a look at XC Tool. Um, it really is an excellent project. Again, we try and run it as a proper open source project. So send us pull requests. And we'll try and land those pull requests so that the community as a whole can take advantage of them. I think that's wicked. Like, I really like it when we do open source properly. It just makes me happy. 
<coughs> Sorry. So the code is available on GitHub. You can download it now. Um, if you use Homebrew, brew install. Um, and if you use Travis CI, does anyone here use Travis? OK, a couple of you. You can use um, XC tool with Travis CI by just modifying your Travis.yaml file. Um, and there are instructions on how to do that in the readme that ships with the project. So um, yeah, do. Go, take a look. Crash reports. Now, even in the ideal world, apps crash. It's a sorry and unfortunate state of affairs, but it's true, and it happens, and we kind of live with it. Um, you can take a look at those crash reports, and on OS 10, there's a tool called A2S, um, address to symbol, which symbolicates the output, right? Um, if it hadn't been run through A2S, all this stuff down here um, that tells you sort of all the methods that were being called and the exciting information uh, would just be random addresses. And you can't do very much with those random addresses. Now, the Facebook app is used by more than a dozen people. And occasionally, it crashes. Uh, you probably have never noticed this. Can't get, that wasn't, you weren't meant to laugh at that. But anyway, when it crashes, we'd like to know why it crashes um, so that we can do something about it. At the scale that Facebook is running at, we get an awful lot of crash reports. And one of the problems we have is that we've only got a handful of racks filled with Mac minis, and we're using those for our continuous builds. How on earth were we going to be able to run A2S in a sensible and meaningful way? So we wrote A2S L, and the L stands for Linux. Um, and what that allows us to do is it allows us to take A2S and run it on our Linux machines. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, this right here um, is one of the uh, is actually three servers from the Open Compute uh, project, um, racked up and, and ready to go. This is what our machines look like in the data centers. If you want to have a look at our data centers, that's on the Open Compute project as well. Um, if you're thinking of building one, do let us know. It'll be quite interesting to watch. If you are thinking of building one, how rich are you? So anyway, yes, we can now run um, A2S uh, on Linux, which allows us to scale up and start drawing the information and the data that we need to from our continuous builds, uh, from, the, from the crash reports. I do beg your pardon. And the really nice thing, well, I wouldn't be standing here talking about how we build software with open source if we weren't open sourcing it. And I'm really proud to announce that as I've been talking, James over here has pressed the magic button. And if you go to github.com slash Facebook, you can now check out A2SL and start getting and dealing with um, and symbolicating crash reports from iOS for yourselves. Um, I think that's a really neat thing. Um, and I think it's a real contribution from our uh, iOS engineers. I tend to focus more on Android. I had nothing to do with it. So um, what have we covered in this, in, this sec in, in this talk? We've covered how we do the basic uh, storing of code using Git, how we use Fabricator for code review, um, how we use tools such as Buck to go super fast and enable us to go quickly. We contribute to and make use of projects such as Celandroid um, and RoboElectric 2 in order to allow us to write unit tests uh, and be effective. And on the iOS side, we have open sourced snapshot test case which Alan spoke about earlier, which allows visual comparison um, so you can figure out whether something has gone awry with the UUI. We've open sourced XC tool, which allows you to have super fast builds for your iOS applications on OS X without needing some obscure tool chain that you've never heard of. And we've just released A2SL, um, the ability to symbolicate your crash reports on Linux. Thank you very much for your time, ladies and gentlemen. We've got some time for questions. Um, and I'd be happy to help answer. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hi, Buck looks very interesting. You probably know that uh, Gradle gets most of the love in this part of the world. How would you compare those two uh, build tools? Okay, How it, so uh, comparing Gradle and, um, and, and Buck, I assume, not XC tool, right? Yeah, Buck. Um, so Gradle is uh, a very good piece of software. I was actually really pleased to see the Android project pick it up. Um, it, was, it seems a step forward over Ant, right? Um, the integration with Android Studio is coming along really well. 
um, I think it's super, super impressive. Uh, tools such as Gradle tend to be focused on the individual steps that you're going to be taking. So with Gradle, you still need to define, like, given the Java code, how am I going to turn this into from Java to a class file and pack it up into a jar, things like that. When you're using Buck, we know that you're building a Java library. So the choice about whether or not you're going to be building, you know, how you're going to be building this jar or not is taken away from you. So that seems like a real negative, right? But what it allows us to do is it allows us to really easily parallelize our builds. Um, and by being out, like everyone's machines, like five years ago, like no one had dual cores in their machines, right? It was almost unheard of. Like really, really rich people had SMP, like two separate processors, and you were in awe of that. That machine over there, the, the, the laptop that I use, it's got four cores, eight if you use hyperthreading, right? And it's got an SSD. Um, it, you know, read and write speeds aren't limited by how fast you can put bits onto Rust. And so Buck being able to run, in, uh, run, run the individual steps in parallel um, gives us a really massive speed boost. Um, the other thing as well is it's really easy to re uh, reason about the build. So I can take a Buck project file, I can take a look at it, and I can tell instantly which are the bits of code that I need um, that affect this particular thing. If I just look at a Gradle target, Personally, I find it a bit harder to do that. Um, but yeah, Gradle's are still an excellent tool. I just happen to prefer Buck. Uh, any other questions? Do you have any recommendation for mocking uh, the unit test, like mocking framework? Any mock framework like um, OC, OC mock for iOS? Do you have anything for Android which you use? Yeah, so um, there's a, uh, the, the, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, I, I've done a lot of work in the, uh, in, in the Java space. We tend to use EasyMock here. Um, it's a fairly good library. Um, it's got a very easy to use interface. Um, I think if I had my time again, I'd be really interested in taking a look at something like Mokito, uh, written by Stefan Faber and uh, things like that. It's a really successful project, which was heavily influenced by EasyMock. Um, so that's super. Uh, Fred. I, are we, do we use OCMock? Yeah, OCMock. Any other tools? OK, and OCMockito. So um, those are the, the tools that we take a look at. Thank you, Fred. Fred, by the way, is one of our superstar iOS engineers. Um, he did a lot of the legwork on XC Tool. Um, so afterwards, just shake his hand or give him a hug or um, buy him a beer or something like that, because, you know, just such a rock star. <laughs> Yeah, um, there's a microphone just being handed to you. Um, so a quick question, uh, just on, on the assumption, uh, XC tool probably is not compatible with the new uh, continuous integration bots on uh, Xcode server, correct? That's a good question. And I'm going to turn to my colleague. Do you want to come up and just handle the... Um... Is it on? Okay. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> so you, uh, you wouldn't use XC tool with the bots at all? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can t <laughs> Right, OK. I mean, it, it just doesn't give you a way to, to plug in any you know, alternative build scripts from what I've seen so far. Yeah. Um, I mean, the nice thing is that we've got a fairly simple set, well, a, 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 a homogenous build, a continuous build environment here. So we know that we go to BuildBot in order to get our continuous build. Um, and we report stuff in, in a regular and consistent way as well. So, and that's really important for us, right? Because the engineers here at Facebook don't just work on Android, they don't just work on iOS, they don't just work on the web. They move teams on a fairly regular basis, um, and having some continuity of tooling is just super important. Um, and it means that when they arrive on a project, they can start being more productive as quickly as possible, um, or less productive for a smaller amount of time. I guess it's the opposite of that, right? Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. My main question is just whether or not it was, uh, whether it was compatible. Yeah. OK, brilliant. Um, are there any other questions? There's a gentleman down at the back there. Uh, the Facebook Android SDK uh, has a, uh, it's, it's very hard to report a problem if something is wrong there. I mean, the, the issue tracker in GitHub is disabled, and when I try to search uh, a way to report it for the Facebook uh, Android developer page, it's pretty hard, and it seems that nobody reads it. I can, I, so uh, there's a part of the platform team are uh, based in London. I can assure you that they do have a read of it. 
they're quite a small team. They're, they're quite busy. Um, but we do take sort of developer satisfaction very, very importantly. Um, and I'm sorry you're having a, a rough time with it. Um, hopefully, I'll go, I'll go back to London and just have a stern word with the platform team. <laughs> Yeah, it, perhaps it would be very easy if it just GitHub issue tracker would be opened uh, if it's already on GitHub, um, because we have several crashes that comes from time to time uh, from Facebook SDK, and it would be good way sure. to report them easily. Yeah, I mean internally we tend to use Fabricator for doing our code reviews and things like that, um, and it hooks into our own issue tracker. If there was some way of bridging between GitHub and an external issue tracker, then um, I think life would be a lot easier. But I think it's an excellent idea, and I'll certainly mention it to them. And I, I can't make any promises, because I just work on developer efficiency for Android. But at least we can ask, right? Cool. Uh, there was a question down at the front as well. You basically send a pull request, but you never merge it, so it's yeah. kind of like, it's open source, but it actually doesn't work like an open source project, so. Fortunately, the projects that I work on, Buck, XC tool, snapshot uh, unit test, um, A2SL, we do run those as open source. We do take it very seriously. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not really part of the platform team, so I really can't speak very much to what's happening there and, and, and why you're having that experience. But. Um, Thank you for the feedback. So I can speak to this just, uh, just briefly. Uh, you're absolutely right, um, especially our SDKs. We've been very slow to, to accept kind of incoming um, pull requests, respond to issues, and so forth. Um, however, we've made actually quite a lot of effort recently to, to start that back up again. Uh, and for those of you that have been following the PHP SDK, for example, where we had, honestly, a big backlog of pull requests, We've really started tackling that one. That was the big one, uh, and we've made some great progress on that already. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that iOS and Android are not far behind. So, you know, please take my word for it. We're uh, we're working our way down the list. Yeah. Um, thank you, thank James, you. by the way, is heavily involved with our open source efforts. Um, That's fair. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole group of us here at Facebook that feel very passionately that open source is a good thing. So we're we're trying to get better. Uh, I think I've got time for maybe one last question. Uh, oh. Okay, I'll do two. There's a gentleman over there and uh, the guy in the blue shirt as well. Hello. Uh, I was wondering if you have a tool you use for sorting the crash, log crash logs after you symbol locate them. Um, good question. Uh, I know that we have insight into the crash logs and things like that. Um, like I said, I'm part of the uh, developer efficiency and effectiveness team, so I tend to focus more on, like, can we build the thing that crashes really quickly? rather than taking a look at the output of it falling over. However, Christian here is one of our release managers. Uh, yes, we do. It's not really open source because it's tightly coupled to our systems. Um, we don't do a bunch of crazy things like machine learning or anything like that. It's pretty much just like if you look at Mozilla's, they have Socorro, uh, which is open source, and they have rules in there. Um, or similar to Test Flight, it's, it's just a lot of looking at frames and grouping stuff, very similar with like regular expressions and various rules. So. Nothing really special there. Cool. Uh, and there was just one last question. Yeah. Um, I've been using Gradle, and I was curious if uh, Buck has support for like Maven repositories, like APK libs and AARs and stuff like that, or is that planned at all? OK. Um, so Buck is a build tool. It focuses on build. Um, tools such as Maven um, are, have a broader focus right, and a broader remit. Um, Gradle does this as well, the sort of um, artifact management piece as well. Um, I'm actually a, <laughs> a really strong believer that you should be checking your dependencies into your own source tree. It's unfortunate that both Git and Mercurial don't handle that particularly well. Um, but what that means is you get a really nice repeatable build. And certainly, um, at the scale that we operate at, being able to have a guaranteed repeatable build is super, super important. Now, you, know, you end up doing things like, OK, well, you set up your own Nexus repo. Uh, in order to make sure that the files that you downloaded are always going to be available. But now you've got another piece of infrastructure that you need to maintain and, and things like that. Um, so at the moment, Buck is just a build tool. It doesn't do the dependency management. You have to figure out how to get them. Um, so I would probably wrap it with something like Rake um, or, or, or another build tool such as that. 
Now, the interesting thing is we are working on a plugin API. So if you feel super passionately that this is something that it should do, even if we don't ship it in core buck, there'll be mechanisms that you can use in order to um, extend buck yourself. And uh, I guess if you fork it and enough people like it, then you know, we, we may be forced to, to pay attention. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm philosophically opposed to uh, dependency management. On the plus side, Buck isn't my project. Um, the guy who wrote it is sitting there in the, in the green t-shirt, uh, Michael, and, and sitting next to him is Roy. Um, these guys do just a huge amount of the legwork on the project. And uh, it's Michael's, Michael's invention and his baby. So he's a great person to talk to and pester about uh, dependency management. <clears throat> sorry, Michael. And when I say sorry, I mean the exact opposite. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Um, coming up next, uh, there's Stephen and Sean from Dropbox who are going to talk to you about building uh, for cross-platform. So uh, let's give them all a big hand. Thank you, guys.